the ceremonial law. God gave them the ceremony to do, not because you know, he wanted them to follow all these rules, but he wanted them to follow all these rules so they would be completely different from the culture around them, right? So he set them up as, wow, look at those people. They're totally different from us. Yeah. So from, from circumcision to the dietary requirements to the way men and women wear their hair to what kind of clothes they wear to everything to how... Uh, how they worship God and, and what they can and cannot do and the punishments for various things and the way they handle various skin diseases even. All these things were regulated so that they would be held up as different from the rest of the world. Everybody could look instantly at them and go, yeah, they are not like us. What's special about them? Oh, those are Jews. Okay, so what's special about Jews? That's where the Messiah is going to come from. So once the Messiah came, all of that stuff goes away because... You don't have to do that anymore because technically they're not Jews anymore. The Messiah came. Uh, so once he came, there's no reason to be that different from the world. And it all went away. So all the ceremonial law went away, but the moral law remains. We still have to follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, but, for example, one of the big differences is we can eat whatever we want. Everything is clean now. Nothing's unclean. And... Uh, like the big example is, of course, you know, homosexuality is still a sin, but we don't punish it by taking them outside of the city gates and stoning them to death with stones. Why? Because that's ceremonial law. That was what the Jewish people did to set them apart from the rest of the world. It's still a sin, but so is stealing a candy bar. That punishment, that's God's thing. The moral law doesn't have anything to do with that. The moral law just says it's a sin. So don't do that, because we're not supposed to do that. So those penalties, all that ceremonial stuff went away. So we don't have to do that. So all the people that love to cherry pick stuff out of the Bible, and they love to just say, well, you know, you Christians don't do what's in your own book, because you don't do none of that stuff in Leviticus. Like, because I'm not a Jew. I don't have to do any of that stuff. And actually, if the Jews realized their Messiah came, they wouldn't be doing all that stuff either, because they wouldn't have to. But yeah, it's, that does not apply to us. But this stuff does. Homosexuality is still a sin. But we can't, we don't take them outside and kill them. And, and, that, and people with Westboro Baptist Church who are saying, you know, the things they're saying, it's like, no, that you're taking the whole book of Leviticus out of context to mean what you want it to mean. And if we did follow the laws in Leviticus with all the sacrifices, mm -hmm. we'd all have to be shepherds. Yeah, we're going to be a, to we're going to be in a lot of trouble because we're screwing up a lot of things. A lot of sheep. Yeah, a lot of sheep. And and honestly, I am not Ooh. that fond of sheep, <laughs> either the animal or the the meat. I I don't care for it. I really don't. I would have problems. Okay, so you don't have to do any of that stuff. So civil law, yeah, it's still there. We still have to do that. I quote, we call it the moral law. The religious and ceremonial law, which we're going to look at in, in detail, because we're going to look at what God had for these priests and the priestly class to do, and we're going to see how that's fulfilled in Jesus, and how, in a different way, we may or may not do the same things today. Uh, not as ceremonies, but as, uh, as worshiper, as part of the Christian life. Uh, for why do the priests have to do this for the people? How, what do the people do on their own now today? We're going to talk about that kind of thing. So one of the big things is going to be, for example, I can pray directly to God. I can ask for my sins to be forgiven. My only intercessor is Christ. In the Old Testament, I had to go get an animal. I had to go bring it to the priest. The priest had to make a sacrifice for his own sins before he could sacrifice the animal for my sins. And then he would act, sacrifice that. And then we would sit down and eat it. And then my sins would be forgiven. But if I offered my own animal, I'm probably going to die. If God's going to strike me down and kill me. That's what he did. Uh, you know, I can't go out in the woods and make an altar and offer a sacrifice to myself because God didn't tell me I could do that. So all I'm doing is making a fire. It's not doing anything at all. But if I pray now that I want my sins, I am asking God, to, I'm repenting and I'm asking for my sins to be forgiven. They are. I don't have to go to the priest in the confessional and, and let him 
educate uh, the law to me and then give me penance to do, and then I go do it. And he says, as soon as I do that stuff, then my sins will be forgiven. Oh, okay, and then I don't have to go do that. I don't do any of that. I talk right to God. So we're going to talk about those differences and, and samenesses. There's a, a, quite a few things that happen in Hebrews. So there is a point to all this. Okay, so religious and ceremonial law, and then moral law they talk about directly here as the commandments. And then it has a nice little paragraph. Here's the Mosaic Law binding on Christians. The moral law certainly hasn't changed of the Ten Commandments. Only one which is not commended of Christians is Sabbath-keeping, though this is disputed by my Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters. So he's even talking about different different groups. Uh, Like I said, he is trying to cover all people who read the Bible to be able to use this study. So he's going to say some maybe odd things, just ignore them. So yes, the Seventh-day Adventists, we're not going to get into them. Uh, But it says, you know, Christians don't have to remember the Sabbath day. I beg to differ. Uh, We do follow the third commandment, which says remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Does that mean we're keeping the Sabbath? No, we're not keeping ceremonial law. Or even even uh, Mishnah, which you know the, the Pharisees said, well, you could only walk so far on the Sabbath day. A Sabbath day walk, as we'll read sometimes in the New Testament. That means you have to count your steps, because if you step any further, that's work, and now you're in trouble. Okay, whatever. Uh, you know why they did all those laws? Because they thought if you did that, you're not even really close to violating the Ten Commandments. And of course, Jesus said, you know, hypocrites, you kind of missed the point. But that's not what we're, actually, what we're talking about here. So yes, we still keep the Sabbath, not all the Sabbath day rules, but we still remember it and keep it a white because on the seventh day, God rested. So on the seventh day, we rest because we're people we're supposed to rest from our labor. Does it have to be on Sunday? No. Do you have to go to church on Sunday? No. Christians picked up Sunday as the Lord's day because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. There's a lot of people who go to church on Saturday night. They're remembering the Sabbath day. They're resting from their labor, and they are going, what do you do when you rest? Well, good thing to do when I rest is go recharge spiritually, go to church, hear the word, receive the sacraments, and I'm refreshed. So that's we remember the Sabbath day in that way. We keep that day holy, and we keep it holy by remembering what God did on that day. Is there not, or was there not, a... Um in a certain areas, at certain times of the year, the Sabbath day would change due to harvest, planting, or dumpling. Oh, I'm sure it did. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it did. On Wednesday, if they had to go cut hay or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always exceptions and, and changes to the rules. And, you know, and that's, in fact, one of the things when you do apologetics on the resurrection of crucifixion resurrection accounts one of the things that the opponents always want to throw at you is goes well when was the sabbath because jesus had the passover his disciples and then well he was crucified on a sabbath day when there was the passover and you know they try to go well see see it's like did you not notice the inconsistency yeah for two thousand years we never noticed that there was multiple calendars being used so you had the pharisee calendar you had the Essene calendar, which is probably the one Christ was following. Uh, I'm not going to get into why my theory is that he was an Essene, but uh, so was John Baptist. That whole group at Qumran, right? Those guys. So you had you had these different calendars, and there were three in use. So that's why, and then you had the Roman calendar, of course. You had different calendars, so the dates might be flaky because the different groups use different calendars. Well, how about that? We have states that have different times. For day, like go to Indiana, and depending on what part of Indiana it is, you don't know what time it is because some of them do and some of them don't do daylight savings time. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, different things changed, and you kind of had to go to your. I believe the way I understood is you have to go to your rabbi, and he's the one who told you what to do <laughs> for your area because you go to different places. Things change. the the best example today is the Amish. Depending on what community you go to, they have totally different rules because it's up to them to decide what their rules are and aren't, whether they, you know, all those things. It depends on the church there, there at that place, what the rules are. And they can be different from place to place. So, so yes, they had a lot of, a lot of that kind of thing to go on. Okay. So yeah, we observe the Sabbath, just not in the same way as Jews. Uh, 
but all the, all the all the commandments, however you number them, however you learn to number them, because I know different churches number them differently. However you number them, there's still there's still ton of them, and you still have things you do and don't do. That has never changed. Uh, so, in that way, Christ did not abolish the law; he kept it, and we still have the law. But we are freed from one thing. What's the one thing we're free from? We're not free from the law. We still have to try to keep the law. What are we free from? Because of Jesus. The penalty. Right, the penalty of the law. Right? So we're freed from the law, as Paul says. We're freed from the law. Not we're not free to do whatever we want, but we're free from the penalty of the law. So the penalty for our sin is paid for. So when we talk about law, we talk about the moral law. And we talk about the law being fulfilled in Christ. We mean the penalty of the law, not the, the binding of the law. We're still in that way under the law. Okay, so you've got the three types of laws that they talk about. And then you have the tabernacle. So we have to look at, and the reason why we're looking at, you know, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law, the moral law, everything. But when we understand the Jewish laws, when we understand the ceremonies, the trappings, everything going on with the priestly class with the Levites and with the tabernacle and later the temple and the sacrifices, you get a greater appreciation of all the things Jesus fulfilled, what Jesus did, you know, what Jesus, not only what he accomplished on the cross, all the things in that law he fulfilled and how now those things apply to us today. That will all become clear when we get back to, to Hebrews, but we need this background stuff, I think, in more detail. So that's why we're doing it. Um, I don't know if the lesson, I didn't pull any lessons, any references to his other lessons out. So uh, the tent of meeting, you got three different terms for the, for the uh, and it's on the next page, how about that? Three names for the tabernacle. You had the sanctuary, the tabernacle, and the tent of meeting. You can use those interchangeably. Uh, kind of like the way we use sanctuary interchangeably now. When we talk about the sanctuary, we mean the whole church. Or the sanctuary is just in there where we do church, right? From the back pew, back pew to the altar is the sanctuary. Um, but then we refer to the whole church as a sanctuary. Um, and they kind of did that a little bit with the word sanctuary as well. I'm not getting into Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. I can't really read Hebrew. I can read a Hebrew dictionary, and that's about it. So I'm not going to pretend to be any kind of Hebrew authority at all. He puts in a lot of good Hebrew words for you, tells you what they mean. They're legitimate definitions. He's a, a pretty good scholar with this stuff, so you can trust it. And he puts in the good way of showing you Hebrew and English so you can figure out how to pronounce it. All right. So the tabernacle tent of meeting, all the kind of same thing. And then he gives you the, nicely, in American units, the size of the tabernacle so you can build one yourself because you actually have, the, you've got this, the people have done that. They, they, you've got everything you need in the Bible to build one of these. Go build it. I wonder how much it costs. Has anybody ever seen that? How much it actually costs to build one? I'll have to look that up, like what it would cost to build a tabernacle because there's some spendy stuff on there. Gold Without the gold. I mean, some of the cloth, I don't think you can get that easily. Yeah. Okay, so it's a fa pretty fancy tent, right? It was supposed to be pretty grand. This is actually where God come, came to dwell on earth. But it has to be portable. They could break it down quickly, and they could move uh, because they were a mobile people. Okay, before we go on, this, sure. is, this, this is the one that Solomon built, right? Which? This temple that we're, this tabernacle that we're looking at. The temple was built by Moses and those guys. Okay. No, Solomon built the first temple. Yeah, he built the temple. Okay. The tabernacle. The, yeah, the, okay. tabern the tabernacle was built on the move in the wilderness. That was a tent. Yeah. T the tabernacle's just a tent. So it was portable. Well, then, what do you call the one that Solomon built? The temple. That was a solid building. Yep. Yeah. So they and we'll uh, we'll see that later. Uh, they will get into the temple a little bit. But a lot of what we're going to read about 
especially concerning the, the priestly class and everything when it was instituted, was instituted while they were in the exile in the in Exodus, in the Exodus. So that's why you'll read so much about the, the tabernacle. So it's pretty good size. 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. That's pretty good size. Um, divided. It had the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And then you had you know, the place where the priests went. That's where the showbread was, the candelabras, all that kind of stuff. Or the candelabra, the lampstand, the incense altar. And then the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. It would become in the temple. That's where the ark was. And uh, that was separated by the uh, curtain. So it has a nice description there. We're not, we don't have to read it all. Uh, but it's got a really good description there with uh, American units to show you how big things actually were. Uh, depending on your English translation, if it uses traditional biblical units, you don't always get an idea like how big that actually is. Yeah, the tapestry, the hides, different things. Ooh, I didn't realize the hides might have been from dolphins. It's interesting. Yeah, so they've got a lot of interesting facts here. And the depiction of the cherubim, I will disagree with him on what he's saying the cherubim look like. I can see where they went there. People insist on saying, okay, well, this is described in the Bible. We found this in archaeology, so it, they must have got it from this. And they love saying, oh, the Jews got this stuff. They pulled it out of Egyptian, out of the Egyptian religions. And it's like, no, I don't necessarily think that's true. I mean, the Egyptian religions were pretty goofy and divided among themselves also. For fun, look up uh, King... Amenhotep IV, he was the guy that decided to change their religion and make uh, the sun the only god. And then declared himself the son of God. And see how well that went for him. So, yeah, the, the, the Egyptians had their crazy mix-ups and uh, upheavals even among themselves in their own religion. Especially when your leader was like a god, basically, made himself like a god. Okay, so you've got the tabernacle complex. It shows you, you know, how big the tent was and then how big the sectioned off place was where only the, chief, the priests could go, the holy place and then the holy of holies. Then you have the uh, laver. I think we will be talking about that. Um, will we? I think we'll be talking. No, that's in the that's actually in the confirmation retreat. We're talking about the bronze laver. We'll be talking about the uh, incense altar. I got too many things going on at once that all actually pull stuff from the Old Testament because we're going to be talking about baptism, and we're pulling all the Old Testament baptism imagery into our thing this weekend, which happens to be like the bronze laver, these ceremonial washings that. Pharisees then talk about later, right? They're, they uh, they were washing everything. They would wash dining couches. They would wash this, wash that, uh, ceremonially. And it happens to be in New Testament Greek. The word is baptizo, where we get the word baptism from. It simply means wash, to wash. So you've got pictures here of all of the tabernacle furniture: the ark, incense altar, showbread, lampstand, curtain. The bronze laver, the bronze altar, and descriptions of that, as well as uh, sizes, how it's made, so on, which is kind of neat. And then, of course, the Ark of the Covenant, and we're pretty familiar with that. Uh, good description there of that as well. Atonement cover. That's a strange translation. I like mercy seat better. Yep, so that's all. That is all a good description. Um, we're pretty familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, uh, but if you want a review of what, what it was about, size, materials, and all that, 
uh, and it also tells you where in Exodus uh, we can find it. Do you think I don't know. I mean, I've heard two pretty good theories. The one theory that it is in a church in Ethiopia is, I think, probably the best one. Uh, I think they very well may have it, but I'm pretty sure it's not the one they everybody says it's in. Because why hasn't anybody ever gone in there? It's Ethiopia. It's not exactly the most stable place in the world. Why isn't somebody stolen if it was actually there? I think it would not still be there. Um, so I think it is in Ethiopia, but I think it's hidden as well. So that church, they'll go, yeah, this is where we think it is. I don't think it is. I think they've got it someplace, and there is some group protecting it for whatever reason. It sounds a little Indiana Jones-ish, but there probably is a group of people that's protecting it. I've heard it's, been, it's under the Temple Mountain, the, under the Rock of the Dome. I've heard that, and I've also... I've, I've actually heard that it's on, on Golgotha. What? It's on Golgotha beneath the site of the crucifixion. Okay. Which, that's a wild one too, but <sighs> there's some pretty crazy stuff that goes on in the Holy Land. So any of those things, I suppose, is possible. I mean, is it under is it under the ruins of the temple? They're, still, they're constantly finding stuff, even there, as much as that's been dug up. They just found something new on the Temple Mount. So yeah, I, it's, I don't remember what it was, but yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and more rooms and, and whatnot. It's like, yeah, it's possible. I mean, it's either lost and destroyed or, or somebody's got it very well hidden and it's not someplace anybody's going to stumble upon it, is my thought. Do you think it's possible that the Lord doesn't want it found so we don't worship? I'm, I, I the think ark. that is also entirely possible that the ark is no longer needed. Right. So, I mean, the original Ten Commandments, that's pretty cool. You know, um, original manna, pretty sure there's not too much left of that. But but the original Ten Commandments, that's kind of that's kind of neat. Uh, that would be extremely fascinating to find that, but I don't know. And maybe he also knew, how are you going to vet it? How are you going to verify that it's legitimate? They would never, ever be done with that. It's like when we were talking, I forgot, was I talking with you the other day? What if they found a biblical manuscript? That was, you know, like Paul's, there's at least two letters of Paul missing that we know of from the New Testament. What if it found one? How would you vet it? Even if, would you ever, I mean, you could never put it in the canon, even though technically the canon has never been closed, technically. But if you found, how are you going to, really, how are you going to get that in the Bible? You'd have to print them all. What a disaster. But there's nothing that has not been revealed. They're not, there's nothing that's going to show up and go, oh, here's this very important doctrine that you've all had wrong. It won't be anything like that, so it doesn't matter. But how could you verify that? How would we not fight about that forever? Any more than the stuff we already fight about, right? <laughs> we need something more to fight. Yeah, so, so is there a reason we can't find it? Probably because God didn't want us to have it. Because could you imagine? And then who would it belong to? Right? I mean, it's my, no, it's my. I mean, Israel, Israel is Israel's, but we all lay so much claim to those. That they, I mean, you've got, you've got areas that the Christians and the Jews fight over so much that the docent is Muslim because he's neutral and it keeps them from fighting about it. And I forgot exactly what area it is in Jerusalem that we get so upset about, but it's one of the, it's one of the sacred sites and the, and the, like the gatekeeper is a Muslim because he's neutral about it. And they don't. Well, it's even better with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That one's pretty bad, too. Because they can't agree. They have to all agree on any changes or updates or, you know, cleanings that, that are done. So there's a ladder from 1859 that is still standing against the front of the Church of the Sepulchre, Holy Sepulchre because they can't agree to remove it. <laughs> so if that's an illustration of how well we get along between the different <laughs> Christian sects. Yep. Uh, right around the corner from there is the Lutheran Church, by the way. Oh. Just in case you're ever in the Holy Land, we're there. I think that we are actually at altar and pulpit fellowship with them, by the way, because I checked. <laughs> All right, so Ark of the Covenant. And then you have all of this. You got you know two whole chapters of Exodus, at least, that talk about the construction, how it's, it's excruciating. It's not excruciating. It's fascinating detail. 
there's a lot of detail to how to do this. So it's probably important that we hear all of that, even us today. It's so important for us to know these things. If for nothing else, then God was probably pretty serious about his house, right? I mean, he gave them all these rules. This is where I'm going to come to dwell with you in a cloud, but I'm going to come dwell with you. I want my house to be nice, right? So they built him a nice house and then later built the temple. So why wasn't the temple ever rebuilt? Good. Good. After not to 70 AD? Good. Yeah. Probably because it was no longer... Because you don't need it. It was no longer a fairly country. Well, that's it. But how come they've never rebuilt it? I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. But, uh, yeah, because it's not needed. Right? It's not needed. We don't need it. But we'll get to that. All right? And then even Moses went on an inspection tour, right? Exodus 39... He inspected the work and saw that they'd done it just as the Lord has commanded, and Moses blessed them. Right, so he delegated all this work. He expected it. Delegation means people were accountable. Right, that's a good point he makes. Right, so on the first day of the second year of their wilderness wanderings, they erected the tabernacle. And even before it was dedicated, God entered his dwelling. He, the glory cloud came down. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Imagine that. That would be pretty cool. And I, some of these words, you know, is like the Shechaniah glory of God. I don't know where some of that stuff comes from. So we're just going to ignore it. Um, Yeah, I, I, I don't know these terms. Right, and then we talked about last week, the priests and the Levites were consecrated. So that's Leviticus 8 and Numbers 8 also. And right before that, all of the stuff in the tabernacle was concentrated, consecrated. Uh, and then the, temp, the tabernacle ministry begins after that. Do you guys want to go back over the consecration stuff that we talked about like last week and the week before? Do that? Okay. So let's look at... I'm just looking ahead to see what he goes to. Yeah, you know what? Let's, let's read. Let's keep reading this little book. I know I went kind of fast through some of that stuff because it's not necessarily pertinent. But we look at, I'll, I'm going down now to where it says dedicating the tabernacle. So we said the priests, Leviticus 8, the Levites, Numbers 8, were consecrated. The tabernacle and all its accoutrements were dedicated, number 7. And ministry in the tabernacle begins for the first time. At the end of the dedication ceremony, we read, Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. And then he says, as I've thought about the order of the objects as one enters the tabernacle complex from its entrance on the east, I see a progression and as one approaches the very presence of God, a progression that is typical of Christian worship as well as Old Testament worship. Since the high priest was the only person who could enter the holy place, we'll use him as our example of worship. Okay, let's see where it goes with this. Okay, so we enter, and then I'm on the page that's got the flow of worship little diagram. Okay. All right, so we enter into prayer and begin to seek God and draw near to him. I will take exception with the word begin to seek God. I don't like that kind of phraseology. Uh, we enter into prayer, we, we are communicating with God. We're drawing near to where God is. And then sacrifice and confession of sin are represented by the bronze altar where sacrifices for sin were made. Yes. Christ is our sacrifice since our sin has caused an estrangement from God. Yes. As we confess our sins in humility and look with faith to his sacrifice for us on the cross, we connect with his grace and atonement. Also, yes. Okay. 
Cleansing and forgiveness are represented by the bronze laver or basin. We receive his forgiveness and cleansing by faith with thankfulness. Also, yes, true. And go a step further and say, obviously the imagery with of any kind of washing should that be lost on us that that is talking about baptism where sin is washed away. Worship is the next step. Yeah. Worship actually began outside where everybody's looking at the tent. So worship already began when you started praying. As the priest tended the lamps, the table, and the altar of incense, we offer regular thanksgiving to pray of, and praise to God in the holy place as a sweet fragrance before him. Okay. Not bad. I mean, yes, for the people in the Old Testament, the priests did the worship. The people were there as witnesses, but the, the priests actually did the worship and they did the work, right? Okay, so... Could not prayers and thanksgiving also be considered today a sweet aroma? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Let my prayers rise before you as incense. And uh, that's in our Matins liturgy? That's in Vespers liturgy, yeah. It's from the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, let, my, my, let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So a prayer posture it is either your prayer posture. I don't know where we got this from, but the prayer posture in the Bible is either face down like that, prostrating, kneeling, or the hands like that, like the priests do. And that fact, I'll even do it sometimes when I'm at the altar, but being, I mean, because it just seems so weird. I, I have my hands out like this, you probably don't even see me do it, because I've gotten exactly that far apart. Not like, because that's showy. I don't like that. There are very few people that, that do that. Uh, but they, that is a rubric to, to open, lift up your hands in a gesture of prayer. So prayer posture, lift up my hands as the evening sacrifice. So yes, so our prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of everything, uh, are are uh, exactly that. Because we get to do that. We don't get to do that for ourselves. But again, the priests offering the sacrifices do that. Okay. Encounter with God in the Holy of Holies is the ultimate goal. Okay, this language is a little spongy, but I, I, it's also not necessarily wrong. I, a lot of folks are going to say, I don't like that word encounter with God. Well, where do you encounter God then? Okay, the ultimate goal is to encounter God in heaven, right? But encounter with God when we pray? Yeah, I mean, we're talking right to him. How is that not an encounter? Now, if you're looking for some kind of mojo sign where, okay, a bush lights on fire and starts talking to you, then that's probably not going to happen today. Not saying it can't, okay? Not saying those things can't happen. Just saying not likely. Uh, So that kind of encounter, people are looking for that experiential uh, type of thing. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. People spend a lot of time in mountains while looking for that kind of experience, and they still, um, you still got a lot of monks on mountaintops doing that very thing. So encounter with God, yeah. Uh, Moses says, please show me your glory. Be careful what you ask for. Paul's cried that I may know him. Yes, you do get to see his glory, but where do we see his glory today? In word and sacrament, because that's where God promises to be. And then you want to experience God. Well, we do that through our neighbor. So I'm not going to leave that out. Uh, how does God work things out with people anymore? I mean, how does God deliver what we pray for? He delivers it through your neighbor working for you. You know, the guy that the guy that delivers your UPS packages, the, the person at the grocery store that stocks the shelves with the food you buy. That is how God delivers our daily bread and everything else we pray for is through our neighbor working as God's hands. So in that way, yes, we encounter God that way. Not as dramatic as a burning bush, but that's how he operates today. Uh, so yes, we, we, we come, we pray, and before him in our Holy of Holies, our words are no longer necessary as we've asked in his presence and look forward to the day in the city of God. Okay, I see where he's going. I think he may be a Seventh-day Adventist. Just the way he capitalized City of God, because he's looking for the new Jerusalem and that, as a new, literal new city. Uh, I'm not going there, but yeah. 
Yes, we are looking for that day when we will be in God's presence, literally. Uh, you know, in that day in the new Jerusalem, there will be no need of light because God will be our light. There will be no temple because God, Jesus, is our temple. There won't be one. So we will see that in, in a way. And I'm not going to deny this. I just have to take exception at his language sometimes. Uh, heaven comes to earth in the Lord's Supper. That's when, when in, in our prayers, I mean, when we pray together, when we pray the prayer of the church with all the saints, that's of all times and places. That's a very special point. That's a special moment in the worship service that, yeah, we're here and our worship service is bounded by the laws of nature, but certain things are timeless. They're outside of that. We don't comprehend it. We don't perceive it. But uh, the Lord's Supper is one of those moments. Prayer, wherever you pray, whenever you pray, that's another one of those moments. Uh, that may sound a little supernatural or science fiction-y, but it's actually what the Bible teaches too. Um, we're just not used to hearing it said that way. I think we should say it that way more, especially about the Lord's Supper. I mean, we do say, you know, that we are communing with angels and archangels and with all the company happen. And on days like the Easter season where the proper preface says, therefore, with James and John, Mary Magdalene and all the saints, because they're in heaven and we can say we're doing it with them because this is outside of time and space. It's infinite. That's why it's a mystery. Enough about that one. I, I kind of, I kind of harp on that. Sometimes. that his, when he said our words are no longer necessary. Yep. No. Then is he saying we don't need to pray? No, I think it's. Because I think that's actually uh, the way I have to interpret that. Because maybe I like I said his phraseology is not the best. But when we pray, and we don't know what to say, are our words necessary? Because the Holy Spirit, Holy the Holy Spirit, Spirit petitions with groans. You know, deep cry. I don't forget exactly how that is said but the holy spirit cries with deep groans uh all the things that we can't articulate when we pray and it also the psalms say you know before the word is upon our tongue lord you know he already knows what we're going to pray for before we pray for it doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for it but it means oh i forgot to pray for so-and-so oh yeah i just did i just did i remembered and oh well is that lazy? <laughs> sometimes, yeah, it is. It is very lazy. And sometimes it's, I just don't know what to say. And you're just sitting there going, and all it is is a bunch of angst and anguish. Not knowing, like, I want to pray for this person. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know how to help this person. And God's got it already. It's like, yeah, okay, relax. I've got this. That's what I think that really means. So when you don't have the words to say, yeah, he's already got it. It was a prayer of... Uh, I heard somebody about this monk. It, it was six, seven word prayer, and it wasn't a lazy prayer, but when it was at that point, I just don't know what to do. And it was, Lord, I can't, you can, please do. No, I like that. <laughs> I like that. It's a smart monk. Absolutely. Absolutely. You just don't know what else. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, it's like, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray like, like, like John does with his disciples. Okay, when you pray, say this. Well, that's it. Really? Okay, that's easy. Like, all right. That's, I mean, that's, it covers everything. And if you notice the prayer of the church, even though it's a little longer, it's the Lord's Prayer. It's a, unpacked a little bit. It, it's the exact same thing. It's kind of neat. So, yeah, we can do a whole Bible study on prayer. We should do that one day. And never get done. Huh? And never get done. Oh, and never get done is right. <laughs> It's kind of like all these Bible studies seem that way. We just kind of stopped. We never actually finished anything, it seems to me. But Okay, so now we get to the priests, Levites, and the sacrifices. All right, so prior to Sinai, it says we've seen a few priests. You know, Melchizedek, not a good example. Uh, and Jethro, but for the most part, the sacrifices were offered by a patriarch on behalf of his family. Okay, because that's how they did it. Because they didn't really have a priesthood yet. Not yet. And Melchizedek's a weird example because he was Melchizedek. He was a he was a priest king that we didn't know much about, and he's just very much enigmatic. Uh, we talked about him a couple weeks ago now, but yeah, he's he's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. You only got four verses. They've written books about him. It's like, how did they do that? Yeah. Theologians got to have something to do. 
And they're interesting books too, by the way. Uh, all right, so we see Melchizedek and Jethro, but you have these patriarchs that are offering the sacrifices. But as soon as the nation of Israel was formed at the foot of the mountain, and God set them up as his people, and he gave them a pattern to atone for sin so that people encamped around him might be cleansed from their sins and remain a holy people. Okay? So priest in Hebrew is, is that an umlaut or is that a long o? Cohen. Cohen. A lot of Cohen. Yep. Cohen, from which we get the common Jewish surname, Cohen, which most of them, at least in Hollywood, are not what you would consider priestly, but okay. The etymology of the word is obscure, as are everything in Hebrew. The priests were charged with ministering to the Lord first and foremost. Daily they offered sacrifices, burned incense in the holy place. Is that ministering to the Lord, or is that ministering for the people? It's ministering for the people. I mean, they're not ministering to the Lord. The Lord doesn't need your ministering. Right? I, I, I don't like that ministering to the Lord. So they're, they're carrying out the sacrifices for the people. They're burning the incense because God told them that's what he wants. Tended the lamps. Weekly, they renewed the bread of the presence and ate the old loaves. Ugh. Must be pretty. What did they say? They had to have milk or something. It had to be like a rock. I was going to say, yes. Like I mean, weak old bread left outside had to be just rock hard. Anyway. Said somebody covering it up. Yeah, but even if they wouldn't be airtight. I mean, they didn't have Tupperware back then. I'm just thinking that it had to be stale. Unless it was like Ezekiel bread, because that's a moist bread, right? Isn't that moist? Is it? Yeah, anyway. Well, if it was unleavened, hmm? if it was unleavened, it would be... No, if it's unleavened, it's just a giant communion wafer. Those are good. Those are good forever. They're stale, but you can chew them and chew them. And they chew had them. to have some way to keep them a little bit soft. Even if they took a lamb's sheepskin and wrapped them in them. Oh, go ask a rabbi. I've been looking for an excuse to go bug a rabbi. Go not Ezra. Oh, what do you want? I have a question. Oh, questions are good because they love that. They're rabbis are rabbis. So what do you want? How do they keep the show bird fresh? And then it kicks me out. I'm just saying, I want to do that. That would be fun. I lo actually love talking to rabbis. They're, they're, really, they're really cool. They love, talk, they love teaching. They love explaining stuff. Go ask them a question. You never get them to shut up. I have some matzo that's three years old and it's still crispy. Is it really? Nice. Sealed or open? Pardon? Sealed or open? Um, I think I've been wrapped in linen. Really? Yeah. And it's still crispy. Okay, she already answered my question. <laughs> I don't need to go see the rabbit. I got to find another question. <laughs> How does it stay crispy? I don't get that. Okay. Um, right. It's kind of like how Twinkies last forever. I don't know. All right, so I'm getting off topic. So they offered the sacrifices. They renewed the bread of the presence. Their first focus was on God. That is true. They were keeping God's temple in order. But their second focus was on the people of Israel. I would say that's their first focus. The priests attended all of the sacrifices in the tabernacle, caught the blood as the animal died, offered a portion of the altar, ate the portion assigned to them. It was hard work. Yeah, it probably was. I mean, imagine, you know, you had to make so many sacrifices. We read the, we'll get to that. We'll read the laws, but... You know, the, the rule for a sacrifice for a sin offering is what? Like lamb, if you, if you could afford a lamb, per person. Okay, how many of these people were there? How many sacrifices are going on? That was a lot of work. They are right. That has to be a lot. So we'll have to look at those and just think. It was per family. Was it per family? You might be, it's still per family. How many sheep is that? It's a lot. Yeah. We'll look at that. Yes, yeah, so we'll look at we'll look at the sin offerings in particular. All right, then we look. At, they've got a nice genealogy of the priesthood. Priesthood. Right, the workers in the temple consisted of two groups: the priests and the Levites. Levites were all those who were part of the tribe of Levi. The priests were part of the tribe of Levi also, but were in addition descendants of Aaron. It's confusing. It's not confusing. All priests were Levites. Not all Levites were priests. So if you're of the Levite of the line of Aaron, you could be a priest. And then otherwise Levites did like, it's kind of like being a rostered church. It's not like this, but it's the closest thing we have is, okay, you're a rostered church worker in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. But not all, all rostered 
not all pastors are rostered church workers, but not all rostered church workers are pastors, i.e. teachers, directors of Christian education. They're all church workers, but they're not all pastors. The same thing here. All the Levites were church workers, temple workers, tabernacle workers, whatever you want to call it, but not all of them were priests. Okay, tithing. The priests and the Levites were to receive no inheritance in the promised land. They were supposed to be supported by the people. So the Lord told Moses, I give the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do. Okay, so one-tenth of their tithe was to be given to the priests to support their families. In addition, the priests received a portion of the sacrifices and grain offerings for their families to eat. Throughout the history of Israel after this, when the nation's faith was strong, the tithe was available to support the ministry, but when it was weak, revival was necessary. Okay, maybe he's Baptist. I can't tell. I can't tell what he is. He's a mishmash because reading his main page, he, he is trying to cover all types of Christianity. So he, he's got a lot of different things mixed up. Why is the word revival bad? I don't know. I don't think it is. We'll talk about revival. Has anybody done, ever done gone to a revival? Like a good old fashioned like tent revival? Anybody? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Revival. Has anybody gone to a good old fashioned tent revival? <coughs> No? Got to a what? Tent revival, a revival. Well, it's a Baptist uh, thing. I've been to several Billy Grahams down at the Cleveland Indian Stadium. Okay. And those were very popular in the 50s and 60s in this area. Mm -hmm. Through thousands and thousands. I know, of he's got a big following in the Lutheran Church in this area. There's a lot of people that did that in those Doug days. Graham. Yeah. He was here several times. Yeah. Uh, about six, seven years apart from each other, because I went twice. That's kind of big time, because he was famous, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking away from doing it, because he was a, a good preacher, but an old-fashioned tent revival was when, the reason it started is like, hey, how do we get people fired up back in church, because people get lazy, and this was back in the 1800s. So, problems never change. And actually, we just talked about happening here in the Old Temple, the Old Testament. It's also, yeah, revival is something you got to do once in a while. Because what do you do to freshen things up again? You don't try something new because novelty is not necessarily what you're going for. But old-fashioned church revival was this guy named Finney, so it was called Finneyism, and all these things start in America. So this was a, this was an American phenomenon. So what do you do? So okay, we're going to go pitch a tent. And we're going to put up a pulpit, and we're going to get a speaker, a preacher, and we're going to get people, and then word of mouth, people will all come out to the revival. It goes on for a couple of weeks. Uh, and everybody come out to the, the revival, and, and you would you know, do some really, really hardcore law preaching, really. You know, scaring everybody into fear of God, basically. It's like, you know, this is what I see happening here, and this is a traveling preacher, so he knows what's going on. And they come in, and it's like, okay, you're all... You're all going to hell, basically. They're manipulating the people's emotions. It was a little... Fire and, fire and brimstone. Yeah, it was a little unfair, uh, but it also got butts in pews, which was the whole point, uh, for a while, and then people get lazy again. But the whole idea of this, this tent revival was to fire everybody up and get everybody back in church, and they kind of worked... And they used some popular things at the time, like today we would probably they would probably have you know a good Christian band that everybody knows that would draw uh, people in because they know who it is, or they would get a preacher. It's like okay, he might not be like Billy Graham caliber, but he's definitely somebody that who would in the that oh I've heard of him, I saw him such and such. Yeah, you should go see him. And this word of mouth thing, uh, and it basically just gets everybody involved and gets them back in church. But again, good idea, not the best execution because it was directly emotionally manipulating people. Uh, and that doesn't last because the emotional manipulation wears off and you're kind of, mm, okay. Uh, but you didn't do this all the time. They did like once a year and they still do it. I know they do it in Ashtabula every year. They do a revival. And it's not huge, but it's the local churches up there uh, do a thing like that. And I know they still do them in the South a lot in different areas. And uh, they do what they do. You know, they, they get people... The good part of it is, is it gets people thinking about church and then, oh, everybody's going. So, oh, well, I'll go check it out too because everybody's going. And maybe some people that never heard about Jesus hear about him for the first time. It's like, 
oh, I've been, I, I, I've been missing this. I'm going to church. You know, praise God. You know, we don't know how the Holy Spirit works, and that's a pretty good way of, of bringing God to people's attention. So a revival, yeah, it happened. You, I guess you had to do that in the old days too, because in the Old Testament too, because people certainly complained, right? They did their fair amount of complaining. They probably needed to be reminded to be thankful, and they probably got a little lazy with oh. supporting their priesthood, right? And, uh, or in times of scarcity, it was probably hard to to take care of everybody. So it was it was. Nobody can say wandering through the wilderness for 40 years was easy by any means. Okay, so you have Levites that are doing tabernacle work uh, during the period of the judges. Uh, they may also have officiated at other altars to Yahweh, except uh, uh, besides the one at Shiloh. They're not sure, and that is true. So uh, it is unknown how many altars there were at certain times. Uh, we have the tithing, and then blah, blah, blah. Bring a whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, is the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open. Throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough left for it. That's neat. That's much different than, oh, okay, don't repent and see what's going to happen to you. It's like, hey, Bring everything into the storehouse and look how much you're blessed, right? They're not even going to have room for it. It's an interesting statement by God, isn't it? All right, Jesus paid tithes. I'm sure he did. Uh, while he said little about tithing, Paul applied the principle to New Testament ministers. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share what is offered in the altar? In the same way the Lord has commanded, those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Yes. So I don't that and it just stops talking about it. So yeah, so the people took care of the priests and the Levites. And then we have all about their garments. We don't have to read about that. But it tells you all about their garments. So they had vestments, we have vestments, they had pretty cool vestments. Actually, we have pretty nice vestments too. I mean, honestly, like the chasubles some of these guys have are just absolutely gorgeous. Um they're also ridiculously expensive. I mean, one chasuble is what an entire set of uh, stoles probably costs. They're, they're really What's ridiculous. A chasuble? a chasuble is the poncho, the holy poncho. It fits over your head. Oh, and it hangs in the back? Yeah, and, and it hangs in the back and it hangs in the front. Okay. And then the, the, the I don't want to say the high priest, but the main pastor that's going to be the efficient at the Lord's Supper, it's got some markings different. It's fancier, so you just know he's the celebrant. And then the other pastors, if you have other pastors, they're a little plainer, but they're still pretty ornate. There's a lot of gold. And they're, they're very pretty, very ornate, very heavily embroidered, um, really spendy because they're all made by hand. Uh, they're, yeah, they're really pretty. And they're really heavy and they're really hot. I mean, if you, if you see them at the, like at the, uh, the chapel at uh, the seminary, Oh. When we have the Lord's Supper, that's what they're wearing. That's yeah. okay. I see. Yep. Okay. So, what page is my on? They're not numbered. All oh, right. So, you're where the staples are. I'm where the staples are. I'm in the middle. And that's where we should probably stop today. Uh, there is a section here on ble the ironic blessing and some other blessings, talking about what that blessing means. Um, so you can read that, and then we will start talking about the sacrifices. We'll talk about repentance as necessary. I like this part because it seems like when you first look at the Old Testament sacrifices, I'm here, I brung my animal. I said brung on purpose. <laughs> I brung my animal, I handed it to the priest, he sacrificed it, my sins are forgiven, I can go home. No, <laughs> no, actually, no. You still have to repent, just like... I asked for my sins to be forgiven in the Lord's Supper and, or in the Lord's Prayer, and I did, and I'm good. Were you really sorry? <laughs> Let's talk about that. You know, repentance is required, so we will talk about repentance next week.
That'll be a good catechism review for all of us. And then special sacrifices, steps in a burnt offering. There's good stuff here. I like a lot of this stuff that you don't usually get in a Bible study. So we will talk about sacrifices next week. And well, once we get through that, then we'll be ready to go back into Hebrews a little bit. Sometimes I think um, confessions and these sort of things were kind of easy. I mean, years ago, they used to really spend more time with the pastors. Mm-hmm. And before you, you still went to the you to register. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you still had a, you had the cleaning cards you had to fill out. I am going to the Lord's Supper next week. Then you went to the pastor's house and discussed things with the pastor, okay. um, which isn't all bad because you do. And like I said, I just think it's kind of very nonchalant almost to go to I mean, I really have to kind of do something. Yeah, know, sometimes we have to, you know kind of refocus our efforts because we forget the whole part when we're mumbling confession at the beginning oh, of the yes. service yes. is I a poor miserable sinner and you confess all the stuff I did and all the stuff I said I was going to do and I didn't do and all that and I know I'm sorry for it 30 seconds it maybe takes us to say that stuff and then we receive absolution now how many times are you concentrating on saying the words with everybody else and not actually thinking no. I'm sorry for the sins I did and think of a few of them. Right. I mean, because, well, luckily we don't have to enumerate them all, as Luther had to do, or as you probably had to do in convent school. Did you have to remember everything? Everything, right? Do they still do that? Yeah. Uh, what I've done, what I've done. Mm-hmm. So you had to enumerate all of your sins, all of them. And if you forgot something, if you forgot one of them, guess what? That one wasn't forgiven. That's... We had a slight disagreement of opinion with Rome with that. But Another but the point is, we don't think about it in that kind of detail. So we just kind of, eh, yeah, I was a sinner this week. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's sometimes it's almost too easy for us. But yeah. then when you remind people, you know you can still go to private confession and absolution. Nobody comes to office hours when you do that. I know. I've done it. Nobody comes. <laughs> uh, you can. Now, by the way, at any time, if anybody ever wants to do private confession, talk to me. And we'll do it. Anytime you want to do it. It's still a thing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people don't realize we still have it. And other people don't want to do it because that's really weird when you sit down and with somebody and are confessing. If you grew up Catholic and you had to do it all the time, I think you got used to it maybe. Because that would be real, and sitting in a box with a curtain thing, even though you know who it is and they know who you are by your voice. You, that little bit of separation is, is enough. When you're sitting in the same room with somebody, even though you're not making eye contact and you're confessing sins to them, that's extremely weird. Because it's very personal. But so is the absolution you receive when they put their hand on your head and said, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. So it's... A useful ceremony. It's a useful way to go about it if you have something that's truly plaguing your soul. Um, that the it's, a, it's very freeing. The attitude of the sin is what the uh, it, it is what we many times don't do. We commit the sin. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I custed you up. You know, you know, that's the sin. Well, what was behind that? What made me? What was my attitude at the time? Mm-hmm. So that that doesn't happen again. You know, just confess. Well, I, you know, I, I said three bad words. Okay, fine. Not okay, fine. You know, why did I say those three bad words? You know, so I don't want to say two next time. But <laughs> 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 I mean, that's like saying, and I'll, I'll use because somebody's going to pull it up. It's like, okay, I may speed sometimes. Okay, so what's the reason why you're always driving so far over the limit because you know the cop's not going to pull you over? Still over the speed limit, so it's technically break, right? It's a sin. One of those gray areas we have. So what's behind that where you always want to do that, right? And that's a great thing to bring up sometimes, I think, when we start thinking about sin because, okay, that's the, 
that was the result of my sin, but what was the core sin that caused that? Huh. Interesting. There, there's a good take-home lesson. I like that. You don't think about that too much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Funny story and a true story, then I'll let you go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine had been given a big box of uh, cookies. Those are uh, grandma cookies, you know, the little snack that. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't going to eat them, couldn't eat them. So I said, oh, I'll take them to church and give them to the food pantry. So I put them in the back of my car, you know, and that was my intention. Well, I kept forgetting they were there. Three or four days later, I had a taste for something sweet. I got a box of cookies. <laughs> All box of cookies. And as I went downstairs, trotted downstairs to get the my cookies, and they only had one package of oatmeal raisin. You know, press them over. Press them that my favorite. Oh boy, that's nice. okay. And that morning, I remember my devotion was about <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> and I looked at those cookies. <laughs> you are going to give them all to the food pantry. <laughs> So I put them all back. And I didn't do it. <laughs> so I told myself, get that box out of my car. But it was, it was a wonderful lesson for me. Some of the simplest cookie. You know, yeah. They were trying to get him in. I said, well, he'll like them. You know, he, he, he'll enjoy it. You know, no, I share the. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We share the sin, you know. But the joy of it was that I remembered, <laughs> you know, that the, the lesson, you know, you got, I'm going to give it all to the food picture. And what I was going to do, just that one oatmeal raisin. No, I so, and, and that was, I mean, by sudden I laughed about that. I mean, you can't handle those cookies. Even if you want them, you can't have them. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, we will stop there for this week. And we'll pick it up again next week at the same bat.